CRA has been in business for uh, more than 40 years. Uh, we uh, pioneered areas of software verification, software quality analysis, and uh, the founder of our company uh, did original research in this field, and it was published and, uh, in fact, still exists. So we've been around for a long time. For many, many years, uh, safety-critical systems were things like um, rail transportation or industrial safety or especially uh, aviation where, where you had very clearly defined software development processes because um, software error, errors in those fields, you know, could result in, in injury or death. Well, now we're seeing uh, that same discipline applied to the automotive industry and especially with autonomous vehicles. It's no longer good enough to just build something, test it a lot, and say that it works. You have to go through a process, requirements-driven uh, development, requirements-based testing, all of those things, and, um, and essentially to certify your system, you have to prove that you've gone through all those motions. You have to prove that your verification results uh, did what they say they do. So we provide uh, a means to do that. And so uh, without further ado, I am going to uh, have Sean Bhattacharya talk to you about uh, ISO 26262 and uh, how to achieve um, uh, the highest software standards. And uh, we'll let Sean uh, go from there. All right? Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, sounds good. So uh, sorry to try to keep you awake through a safety critical standard right after lunch. If you start dozing off, I want to take it personally. <laughs> uh, so so uh, when, when, we, when we talked to Aaron and Ian and, and folks about doing a workshop, and it was an hour and a half long, uh, I thought, well, you know, is this going to be hands-on? How interactive are we going to do it? Uh, and it's easy to kind of get a lot of these concepts across in a nice 30, 45-minute chunk, and let you absorb it and digest it, and then, uh, and then discuss it later. But an hour and a half is quite a while, and I wanted to keep things a bit interactive. So what, what, I've decided, what I decided to do was cover different sections of uh, adherence to ISO 26262 if we're talking about traceability, unit test, specifically part six, yeah, a little bit of part eight, uh, and, and then maybe do a little bit of inter internal discussion. I'll, I'll query you and ask you what you think about these uh, concepts and problem areas you run into when linking requirements and models and tests together and trying to get things to run in a particular target environment. So, uh, so just we'll, we'll do 10, 15 minutes of talking and take a little break and do some discussion and, and hopefully that'll keep us all the way. So to, to start with, uh, as, as Bill already mentioned, we've been around uh, for about 40 years and, and our, our initial drive was in commercial avionics. We helped uh, drive the original DO-178B standard. We're on the DO-178C standard committee. Uh, we were also heavily involved in MISRA. Uh, it started out as an uh, initiative in the UK around uh, um, uh, a small handful of folks, specifically around the automotive industry, and then, then ever since then, it, it's really transcended the automotive industry and it's adopted as probably the most popular embedded coding standard uh, out there. So about the four out of eight of the members of that committee work for us. So you know, we've been heavily involved in building the tools to help automate checking for these things, at the same time uh, pushing the standards boundaries as well. So we have to kind of do that, that dance. And these are some of our members and their pretty pictures. Many of them have been involved uh, in, in the space uh, for 20, 30 years plus. So uh, I think this crowd is pretty familiar with 26262, right? I, I, I've, I've heard it being mentioned all over, and I'm, I'm not sure how uh, software-focused everybody is, but m most of you seem to be. Uh, so what I'm going to just touch on are several of the really heavy uh, challenges, heavy workload uh, components of 26262. So starting from uh, traceability of requirements through code and test, right? Uh, that, that, that spec tree that you're dealing with could be 50 blocks talking about a system of systems all the way down to uh, uh, just a handful of requirements uh, for a little bit of firmware that sits on a chip. So the, the, the left side of the V could be uh, a massive tree or a little seedling. And then, of course, the, the code you're writing or code you're generating or existing code you're trying to fold back into compliance, all of that has to be uh, shown how those requirements uh, then get implemented in that software. And then finally, on the right side of the V, at each tier of that V model, you need to do verification activities to make sure that the expected behavior on the left side 
and the actual behavior uh, and the, the verification of that expected behavior with tests and the actual results are, are uh, in fact verify that the behavior expected in the system is actually there and, and uh, at, at each tier, at each level of granularity of your system, at each level of uh, subsequent detail in your black box. Uh, if you've gone through 26262, uh, you've seen uh, a, a good bit of detail about coding standards, about uh, dynamic memory allocation and pointers and so on, uh, even re references to coding standards. So you've probably done some work in trying to adhere to some coding standards internally. You probably developed your own coding standard or picked something like Misra off the shelf or struggled trying to fit some legacy code into uh, something like uh, Misra and given up and been miserable. But anyway, you've, you've, you've gone around the block. <laughs> Somebody got the miserable joke. <laughs> uh, data and control flow, uh, some of you may have a good grasp on it. Others are scratching their head and confused. Uh, I, I do both during different parts of the day because that particular term can be interpreted uh, um, all over the map. So we'll, we'll go in the middle discussion of it. Uh, structural coverage code coverage that can be an extremely time-consuming activity if you don't plan for it up front it can be one of the big bottlenecks that keeps you from shipping your product understanding at what scope to get structural coverage at the functional test scope at the unit test scope on your target on a functional simulator running model tests and getting model coverage versus code coverage and their equivalents there's a lot of different things that come up here but that is one of those activities that can soak up a whole bunch of time and it'll sneak up on you and all of a sudden you're blowing your schedules. And then, of course, ultimately you want to do a lot of this verification on the target hardware, right? Functional tests all the way down to unit tests, including structural coverage, because we all know that's where rubber meets the road. That's when you get uh, different types of instruction sets, funny floating point behavior, you reveal what's really going to happen when you, when you reveal your product. And, and we all know that we can't do this stuff manually. We can't get our code coverage by uh, looking at a bunch of tr raw trace data coming off of a target. Uh, we can't do our requirements traceability by using just nothing but Excel spreadsheets because it just becomes too big, too unwieldy, too hard to keep up. So we typically develop tool stacks, right? PLM tools, ALM tools, verification tools, modeling tools, all that stuff, and we have to stick it all together and hope they, are, they connect and have a digital representation of our physical software development life cycle and that, that you're able to uh, uh, handle churn on the front end, you're able to have multiple variants of your product and all of that type of stuff. So we have lots of tools we're dealing with and we have to make sure that those tools are credible. And then ultimately all those tools, all those tests, all those reviews are going to produce a ton of artifacts and you need to be able to collate all these artifacts as you go instead of throwing a big pizza party on the weekend before your auditor's coming and put it all together in a nice organized way for each of your products and, and be able to uh, meet and show that you're showing compliance to the standard. So that's, that's effectively the, the top to bottom of what we're going to go over. And so we'll start with uh, kind of keeping track of all the things that you have to do uh, for your software. Or, and this, 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 of course, uh, extends to your whole system with regard to meeting ISO 26262. So there's lots of, lots of individual things you have to do. You have to show traceability between system requirements and software requirements, and software requirements and detail design, detail design and unit tests, and so on. And as you produce these artifacts, you have to collect them and organize them and make sure they're properly ECM'd. And of course, as a little bit of code changes, you have to rerun those tests, grab that artifact, and pull it back in. So if you don't have an infrastructure for capturing that data, making sure that it's, it's fresh and in sync with your baselines and baselines, uh, then, then you're going to potentially get yourself in trouble. And when an auditor digs around and sees a slightly different date here and a slightly different coverage here from the, the most recent drop of code or something of that nature, they're going to see uh, discrepancies and uh, they're going to make your life a lot of fun. Uh, and ultimately, with, with, when it comes to compliance and managing your roadmap to compliance, it's nice to bite off little chunks as you get your artifacts out of the way and make sure that you've banked that, that equity. Right? So to be able to say, okay, do I have all my requirements documents in place? Have I reviewed them all? Uh, how's my relationship between requirements and, trace, uh, and design, ar uh, design artifacts? Uh, and have I captured all of that? Great. Now let's go on to implementation and so on. So it's important to create an infrastructure where not only is, is your compliance guru aware of that, but the folks that are actually doing the unit testing, the folks that are actually doing uh, 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 code coverage or development work or modeling, they all have transparency into that, that world. 
that they have that joint and shared ownership. So it's really important to create some sort of infrastructure, whether you're using this tool or you're using some a document management tool or an ALM tool, uh, to, to be able to, to keep track of where you are in terms of compliance. So this is our V model spec tree with little uh, 6-6, 6-6-7, all those numbers that you see next to software safety requirements and software architectural design, those, are, those numbers are right out of the 26262 standard, right? So if you, uh, I think these slides are going to be published at the end. If you haven't quite dug into every part of the, the, the 26262 standard and you want to drill into any particular part of it, uh, it's good to, uh, you know, these slides will be available and you can, uh, you can correspond them and, and dig in. Um, this V model is, is ubiquitous, you know, in, in any uh, safety critical hard real time uh, um, industry. So you'll see it in DO-178, you'll see it in IO-61508, uh, you'll see it in 62304 for medical devices. Uh, but there are some interesting uh, components to this, and one that always confused me was what is a software safety requirement versus just a software requirement, right? And that, at first glance, seems quite obvious. But then the question is, if I'm going to go through all these verification activities for my safety-specific requirements, and then I have a, a bunch of other behavior that doesn't really, aren't really directly linked to uh, safety-related behavior, so I shouldn't have to do any of this stuff, uh, any of this extra verification activities for those requirements, right? Well, depending upon the standard you uh, consider, and when you consider those requirements, uh, and the respective code is all going to be running in the, in the same executable, right? And so maybe a non-safety requirement writes out into uh, a particular location and somehow an input data that, that you're getting for that, that uh, piece of code uh, is really converted to an address and that data gets gobbled up and all of a sudden you're writing into some area of memory which is really uh, some global data for a safety requirement. So the question I always struggled with was, was uh, where is that boundary and how rigorously do you, do you have to enforce it? So I, I have seen that interpreted many different ways. I have seen uh, software managers and product managers say, you know what, we're just going to treat them all as safety requirements. That way we don't have to worry about not doing our homework uh, on something that can then affect my uh, system's behavior. And others that have taken those software system requirements clearly map them to their design and created uh, uh, verification uh, uh, activities based on, on that relationship and model the risks associated with, with those requirements in a very uh, um, methodical way. The software architectural design, I, I've seen that represented in, in uh, uh, Visio diagrams, in UML, in all sorts of, uh, um, all sorts of uh, approaches. And I've seen the, this left side of the spectrum go from software, uh, software safety requirements down to SDD or software design description or unit design requirements. And then I'd see the architecture sort of hanging off to the side, or I've seen it kind of be serialized. So somebody's going from a safety requirement then breaking it down to a piece of architecture and then breaking down really detailed pieces within that architecture. So whether that's sort of inlined or sort of hanging off to the side seems to, seems to a very great deal. That little bit there, that little traceability to code, if you, if you search through the 26262 standard and, and, and search for traceability and get into the tables in the back, you'll see that specifically mentions traceability of these uh, software unit design elements down to the actual implementation of the modules. And so how, how you manage traceability code, some people do it explicitly, some people say, well, that whole set of requirements there, that points to this big, CS, this big chunk of code and this set of functionality here. Others will say, for every function in my application, I have a little specific expected behavior at the detailed design level, right? Uh, both expected behavior and how it's to be implemented. So that, that granularity you have to decide up front. And then there's, there's a big trade-off there, because you could uh, spend all your time creating a bunch of links, and your code's changing really fast. And it creates a huge overhead without a lot of additional benefit, added benefit. But I've seen the exact uh, same opposite before, where people are doing traceability at a very high granularity, and of course, uh, um, they're not getting any value out of it. They're just showing that they're linked to it, and they're generating a table that really doesn't have that much uh, meaning. Now, on the right side of the V, uh, we're talking about different types of verification, and there's lots and lots of different V models. You type the word V model, go to Google Images, and you can scroll through 10,000 unique pictures. Uh, so, what, what's a good way to test this software unit design? Obviously, a unit test. But then the question becomes, what is a unit? 
Is that just a function? Is that a, a several set of files that is a whole set of applications? So you really have to work out your scope at, at, at what level uh, you're going to describe a unit, how you're going to decompose your system. And integration, of course, we know that's lots of different levels of integration. You could be running a little box that's driving messages into an ECU, or you could have a whole bunch of boxes connected together with a huge test set, it's pumping signal data with National Instruments stuff, and it's just a, uh, count, uh, run by a counter, and it's, it's uh, running at a, a, particular, a, a particular rate, and you're doing basically a hard one in the loop. So this, this can be, of course, at, at uh, many different scopes. So just touching on traceability, uh, of course, we have to write requirements in one scope and then decompose them down to a higher level of detail. We start at the system level, start, de start allocating them to hardware and software, uh, get down to functional requirements, software functional requirements, right next, down, next level, low, uh, uh, level down requirements. But one of the things that I find that, that create a lot of issues up front is both requirements writing and requirements reviewing and not properly reviewing that traceability not spending the time with the right subject matter experts in place to think about that decomposition and see if it's really that meaningful. You know, link is something so uh, ambiguous that it's just easy to say, well, this kind of also links to that, and this kind of also links to that, and all of a sudden you get this crazy phenomenon, like, um, let me see if I have, I think the animation here is not coming on. Well, you have one requirement that's mapped to potentially uh, you know, 50 lower level requirements and uh, so you get the sort of the thing shall fly type of requirement, right? Or you see strange phenomenon where you, you look at a piece of code and you, you look up and it's linked to one unit level uh, detail design element and it's linked up to 15 or 20 different software functional requirements. D do you all see these types of issues coming up consistently? All the time. And how do you deal with it? Right. And, and where, where do you think the real gap is? What, what, do, you, what do you think it takes? The gap, in my opinion, is what is system. Electronic system is the security architecture, the system, mechanical systems, the system, what is the system, and what level of abstraction each system should deliver as an output, and what should be sufficient to implement as an input? I, I worked with Lockheed Martin for several years, and, and I was in a, uh, uh, I ended up leaving as an IPT lead. And I was in a working group, a requirements best practices working group. And I was a requirements writing guru that I spent a lot of time with. And he kind of cleared things up for me. The reality is we don't learn how to write requirements in, in college. Not, most of us didn't. <laughs> then you guys uh, are learning this. And, and they, they don't tend to think in terms of levels of abstraction, big, big black box expected behavior at that edge. The next one's going to, you have to decompose down to its respective edge. And they have to reconcile. Exactly, exactly. And there's only so many experts running around, and, and it's hard to tell where somebody's. Right, right. I, f I find that uh, getting people that are both subject matter experts and people that are good at writing requirements and reviewing requirements, getting them together, <laughs> because people that are often good with requirements engineering may not be uh, uh, great with baking systems or. or uh, Exactly, exactly. So we find that we're, we're a verification tool company, so we're, we're, we get to stick our finger into lots of different environments to sort of see other people's band-aids and scars. And, and we find that most defects are still happening at this phase, that left side of the V. And, and it, the proportionate amount of time being spent there is relatively small compared to the pain down the road. This is, a, this is a problem that we all are aware of. We've all seen that little chart where the cost of defects goes up. We all hear about recalls. But we can't seem to fix that front end problem <laughs> well, right? And as soon as we get our hand on it, all of a sudden the complexity and the number of requirements just skyrocket so much that we can barely wrap our hands back around it. Yes. 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 Right. 
right? It, it doesn't fit the business model of incremental cost, yeah, yeah. <laughs> incremental yeah. return. So let's scrap it all, let's build it again, and we'll do it better, and we'll make a lot more money in 2020. <laughs> and it's difficult to convince them of that. And yes, uh, this, this is a typical problem with reverse engineering compliance to a standard. You have some good subject matter experts that threw together a nice big Word document, understand how a black box works, and then of course it starts to evolve and clobber, and then you realize you really have to scale, and you can grab this new market, let's go think up a design document, and let's take that initial document and clean it up, and we'll make that our system spec. And that's kind of software. We'll take all the system has, and we'll make the shell, and we'll make them software shells. And these go to hardware. But then we look at it, the traceability, and granularity, and verifiability hasn't been done. But then to go rewrite all that, it's just cost prohibitive. So, you know. Yeah, I agree. The referees aren't coached together, right? And uh, um, I, I, I see this problem a lot in the commercial avionics space. But it's the, the band between the East Coast DERs and West Coast DERs, that's the designated engineering representative of the FAA, to me is a lot closer together than what I've seen from auditors in 26262. Because I see this is it's a relative new space, right? A lot of people are learning. And, and, and the reality is, uh, you know, you spend, X number of, maybe you get, uh, let's say, 10 hours per line of code, I'm just picking a number out of thin air, you're going to get 30 minutes per line of code in the automotive world because you're writing so much more code and your, your time to market is so much faster and you're integrating so many different existing systems together and you have to get them out to market. So it's difficult to get that level of rigor and that le level of consistent referee behavior. So everybody's trying to probe and see what do you really want? What, what level is good enough for you? So you kind of put a little bait out there and see, see what, what's good with them. So they use that to gauge kind of where you are and how to push you. So they add a little ex few expectations and so on. But from program A and company A to company B, you see very different practices, right? And, and um, that, that's, that's a good bit of challenge there. Here, here's a traceability portion. How many of you are actually doing traceability from detailed design to code? Can you get a show of hands? Yeah, definitely. How many of you are not taking your detailed design and requirements and associating them somehow? Yeah, that, that's a different question too, exactly. And, and, and you know, some are just saying, okay, all of this connects to all of this. Good, we're done. And, and to what granularity are you doing it, right? Are, are you linking to the file level, to a set of files, down to a function, down to a line, which is impractical? Yeah, at the file level, right? So we typically see file to, to function level uh, of traceability. And, and the big challenge, of course, is this is where the many-to-many -many relationship is most intense. Right? At the higher level of the spectra, you may have a, a thousand requirements here and four thousand requirements there, ten thousand of these connected to <laughs> ten thousand of these. So as you tickle this guy a little bit, you get this massive amount of churn. So figuring out an efficient way to be able to see impact of change, clean up your suspect links and redo links is, is very important. And then one uh, uh, very deceptive uh, cost here is most of us in automotive and, and in any industry in general are trying to have multiple product lines. So that same piece of code is being reused in five or six different variants. In automotive, I see a whole lot of macros, you know, showing that hey, if, I, if I change my build mechanism a little bit differently in my make file, all of a sudden, all these lengths are different and so on and so on. And so what code are you actually linking to? Which instance of that variant are you linking to? It is, uh, but... Um, when, when you do traceability from a, a requirement to that code, you might have seven different tags if you're putting tags in comments, right? Now, if for the variant one and two, if you decide to break that function up, all of a sudden the tag management nightmare multiplied by 10,000, tag management nightmare uh, grows enormously. So it used to be very smart to take a, a prototype of a function and stick it in the column and doors or uh, an ALM tool. Uh, and you used to be smart to put a requirement ID uh, in the comments in your code, but it's not really scalable anymore. You have to let that data be managed externally, right? So we, we do that with a drag and drop, we manage it externally. One of the things that we, from our technology, which is pretty interesting, is that uh, we have our own static analysis engine, and, and along with uh, the, the, the front end of that, that does a lot of the stuff that 
compilers do, parsing, scanning, tokenizing, all that good stuff. We also have a preprocessor, just like the C preprocessor does, right? So if you have five different variants, mostly different by macros, when you're getting down to do the actual mapping, you're mapping the post preprocessed version of the code to the requirements you're interested in, right? So you have slightly different variations of code you're looking at in that column on the right, so you're not trying to, uh, trying to pick out the slight differences and, and make those distinctions. Ah, this is the, the traceability picture I wanted to bring up to you. I see this kind of stuff all the time, and I see this kind of stuff all the time. If you can see the picture, you have one little blue guy here at the system level, so take the left side of the Wii and flatten it out, and it's hitting a whole lot of blue. And when you get down there, this little system little requirement may be mapped to 30% of your code, right? And this was a problem that I always wanted to solve when I was uh, at, at Lockheed because I was working, this was my autonomous experience, by the way, unmanned guided vehicles. If you've seen the Mule program, it's about 6,000 pounds, six-wheel autonomous vehicle. It was part of the great falling future combat systems program. <laughs> the technology was great. The, the, the $32 billion weight and the, the bureaucracy ended up eventually killing it. Uh, but we used to get probed by colonels and program managers uh, uh, on a weekly basis asking them, you know what, I want to move the gun from this side of the UGV to this side of the UGV because I'm really worried that this guy's going to swing around and shoot that guy's head off. So uh, can you change those six requirements there? And so we would have the conversation, then we'd have to buy time, then you'd have to come back in and bring all our technical leads together and try to figure out what the cost is going to be. Then we went back and told them, yes, it's six months and a million dollars. But then they wouldn't believe us. They said, you're just moving the stinking thing. It affected all of our latency times, our waste database, all kinds of stuff uh, was heavily impacted. But we couldn't see it. It wasn't, you know, the granularity and the traceability of the detail wasn't there. So, but now with standards like 26262 and DO 170, if you have to try to do this on a large scale with lots of product lines, you have to get this level of traceability. Otherwise, it's just unwieldy, and, you know, or you're faking your way through it, one or the other. This is the other funny phenomenon where you may have lots of expected behavior sitting way down in a 20-line function. <laughs> and you can't really see that, that uh, traceability uh, um, uh, anomaly, I'd say, or issue until you see it all inside of one, uh, uh, one synthesized view. You know, if you look at them next to each other, yeah, that looks good. That looks good, that looks good. And systems guy, software guy talking here, and a test guy, and <laughs> the software guy talking there, but never got a chance to synthesize that information. So let's go on to the right side of the V a bit. So of course, when we write functional tests, I see a lot of testing in isolation of requirements. A lot of it. You know, they have a subject matter expert that uh, the, uh, a uh, good implementer uh, wrote the code, and then he went off and wrote the unit tests. But I don't see them going back and reviewing the requirements and really making sure that that unit test verifies that requirement you know, with, with a lot of discipline. Now, this varies dramatically from company to company. Right? In some companies, they do this a phenomenal job. And others say, no, I've unit tested it, and I've got 100% coverage, and I'm good to go. Yes, you took up the brick, and you shook the heck out of the brick, and it looks like a nice, shiny brick. But when you put it together with all the other bricks, are you going to build the right house? And, and that, that's a problem that we see that's very, very common. And it's all over the map. The, the part that, that I think that would resolve most of you know, not testing the requirement well enough is to spend more time on reviewing how you've modeled the test to verify your requirement before you go off and create the test and execute it. Do you agree? Sure, sure. So for in, in, in our tools and in others, basically, as soon as some requirements change, you take a quick snapshot of what's changed, added, deleted, and, and modified, and you generate impact analysis reports. Obviously, you have the infrastructure together. If you're using Doors or Polarian or PTC or, or, or our tools uh, or combination of ours and theirs, you have to be able to s s have those linkages there, and you have to have the technology to trickle their way down and gather all that data. Then you have a whole bunch of suspect links all the way down the code, all the way up through tests, and then you have to have their respective teams and subject matter experts review them. And it can become a very cumbersome collaborative process. And if you, if you don't do it right, you'll just kind of skim through and say, ah, these changed and the, the impact is uh, minimal enough. Yeah. 
and well, well that, that, that specific point where you're taking a legacy application and you've re kind of reverse engineered the left side of the V and granularized the right side of the V and you've stuck it all together and you're happy, when you have impact to those systems, impact analysis is a monster. And it's so hard, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, it's working well. That's the first part. And the second part, the test units normally very similar. So you can make a really less as well. Right. And, and if you have a platform not to know what you change it. And, and I believe the most goal is, I fully agree with you, we have to go in this professional way. But if you have 50% code always the same, yes. then you have to take care only of the rest of it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You make a cultural shift. That's it. That's it. That's it. The, but the start in this process is the hardest part. You have to get senior management approval. I find that the most clever way to do it is to find little nuggets of gold in your technology, right? Some good algorithm, one little unit test, uh, one set of unit tests and a few requirements, and pull that out. Build the small libraries that you can reuse. And after that, at that first iteration, go to your management and say, look, 20% of our cost got cut up at a front because three smart guys spent one week to make sure we could pull it all over to variant B. And if, imagine if we could keep repeating this process, where we would be, you know? And that you have to sell it internally. But plucking out little pieces, like at least do this with common filters. Um, when I was at Lockheed, uh, I spent most of my time on uh, missile defense. So we had three, four different interceptor missiles. Very, very, very high uh, quantitative stuff. You know, there's five or six guys in the world that can do this and uh, that efficiently with the right level of fidelity. And that little piece of code is gold. And then I'll, we won this big contract for you know, a different range missile, but we needed that autopilot code, and we needed that, uh, that, uh, that common filter code. So we pulled that out, a few requirements, and you know, you do this intuitively, right? We did Agile back then intuitively. Your idea is not working automotive. I can give you a better solution. Okay, please. Right. You go there internally, forget, forget it. Right, you right. Convince the customer, uh, the, big boss, the biggest bosses are coming there to get it. Right, right. That's, that's so an adaption of you. That means he sold this before. <laughs> he, so he, had to sell, he had to sell the idea to his customer to convince his senior management to fund it. It's easier. <laughs> it's easier. Right. Because the customer writes the check and the senior management will go along with the check. Sorry for that. No, 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 please. This, that's the whole, uh, whole purpose of, uh, of our... Uh, of our discussion. Uh, in terms of functional testing, uh, we find that everybody creates their own functional testing framework or, you know, they, functional testing can be such a wide breadth of scopes of tests. So whatever you end up doing needs to be an extensible and open system that you can plug anything into, that you can uh, plug in a, a lab view and test stand into, and then a whole bunch of Python scripts that you're running into them, some little PC that you have that's sending a bunch of messages to a little box, and then something else where some, somebody comes along, takes a procedure, and just punches a bunch of buttons and looks for a red light. All of that has to be encompassed into one framework. You have to be able to capture that in one place. We find that not only is the testing market as a tool vendor very fragmented, how one particular system gets tested or set of subsystems get tested is often very fragmented. And, uh, and you have these big cultural divides. So those are the, those are the, 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 the please go ahead. Yes, it should be. It, it, or even if you do this, do something uh, unique, I don't want to say archaic, but different in one, or one way, at least find a way to capture that data and normalize the identifier sets, normalize the columns and the attributes so that when you do migrate it over into your, you know, your ALM tool. Because it's different silos of organization that are in different areas. That's right. 
Uh, but you need a kind of a chief engineer type who can keep their hands dirty and jump back and forth and, and clean that up. Uh, because you, you, know, you have your uh, guys that have their head inside of Simulink models all day, and you have somebody over there doing some kind of manual testing, and you have some great guy that's come along and automated a bunch of stuff with XML and Python, and you're trying to put it all together, <laughs> it, it becomes very hard to have a nice crisp V, <laughs> right side of the V. You know? And you know that if you don't get this right, you're going to get in trouble down the road with an escape defect or... Yes, yes. The cost is too high. But you know, unfortunately, you know, we tend to do all the right stuff. We tend to do more right stuff on the left side and less right stuff on the right side because we're just running out of time. We're always running out of time, right? So you, you tend to kind of sprint your way and kind of cobble that together. But personally, I find the most successful, successful programs are the ones that get the, the testing part of it down uh, really well. Because if you get the testing part of it down, it, it highlights all your mistakes on the left side of the V. <laughs> You know, forces you to, 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 to face the music on the requirements end. Otherwise, you're kind of soft and fluffy on the right, and you can get away with soft and fluffy on the left, right? Uh, low level or unit testing uh, is a, um, uh, it requires the same level of respect from a traceability standpoint in terms of how you're going to write that unit test. Go look at that detailed design and really figure out what part of the interface is supposed to be hit, what nominal conditions there are, and create those. Uh, create that traceability on its own. I see a lot of traceability at the higher level, higher, higher parts of the right, right side of the V and the, and the left, but I see people dropping the traceability ball at, at unit test level. So they tend to just create test cases to verify what they think they've implemented, what they know they've implemented, not necessarily what they expect that application to be doing, what they expect that, you know, uh, that matrix multiplication function to be doing. Right? So, so I know exactly what it's doing. I'm going to create a unit test to go drive all those little conditions. But I didn't go look at those seven or eight elements in my detailed design to see what did they write down that it's supposed to be doing. I feel that that traceability is not done enough. How, how, how you, how's that uh, coming along in, in your, uh, your experience? Traceability from a unit test standpoint. I know some of you are much heavier into software than others, so uh, feel free to take a nap. <laughs> but ultimately, the, uh, these, these problems are, are, are uh, common across all engineering disciplines. You know, you, you'll see the exact same analogy in a, in a bomb explosion and so on. So coding standards compliance. Uh, coding standards themselves, we ourselves have been in this game for a long time, since uh, 19... 75 or so, uh, heavily involved in MISRA, as I mentioned, with CERT, which is a, a security standard, secure coding standard. Uh, but coding standards adherence is not as simple uh, as it seems. Um, most of us who, who've gone through reviewing code and done peer reviews have gone through the experience of you know, a six-month drawn-out brainstorm session to come up with this cool coding standard that's super relevant to our product. And they write up this phenomenal standard, and I've seen that standard collect dust on a shelf over and over and over again. And then I've seen, okay, it's time for peer review in four hours, and somebody goes and looks at 10,000 lines of diffs and making sure that they're able to pull out enough nuggets to look like they did their homework, right? So what they look at, they look at tab spaces, they look at uh, the easy stuff to pick off at a scan, right? So you end up missing a lot of the value of the peer review. <laughs> You, you, uh, on all the exercises, uh, the, the, that thought exercise of coding standards, and I've seen engineers fight out over silly little things uh, inside of peer review, doing peer reviews and argue about style and tabs and brackets and uh, cyclomatic complexity till they're blue in the face, and not spend any of the time talking about performance of their application and architecture and all the, the cool higher end you know, uh, synthesis of thought type of stuff that they should be spending their time on. So now the world has come to realize that you need to be checking coding standards in an automated way. Let the machine do that part because it's good at it. Free your brain up to do the, the, the smart stuff. Uh, so we, we allow for, you know, selection of a thousand rules or so from anything to do with tab spaces to array bounds exceeded and shifting too far and customize your own coding standards. But there's some other uh, funny things that happen. Oh, by the way, so when you run coding standards adherence, you get reports. You get an artifact, right? Plugs right in to the different things that, that 26262 requires that you demonstrate. So that's just one of those things that sort of pops out of the standard as you go further and further uh, to the right of the um, coding standards, to the, to the right of the development life cycle. 
So that's just a little snapshot of history of coding standards. Um, KNR, Kurtig and Ritchie, if you've had the, had the book uh, and learned, uh, and then we first got involved in 1975. Uh, there was uh, Bell Labs, and initially Lint was being used internally, and then you know leaping forward into Misra in uh, 1998. Uh, just a handful of folks in the UK uh, got together and and did their best to collect portability and reliability uh, issues that they were aware of, and put together the first instances of Misra. It was a good, good first cut, but you know, we found that not a lot of stuff could be automated. There was a lot of ambiguous bits inside of Misra, and so you know, more and more people adopted, more and more people whined about it. We'd say, okay, give us the feedback, come into the, uh, the standard just like you were doing, come help us. If you want to whine, help us, you know? And, and then we kept on, kept on going, and then uh, uh, in C++, uh, Misra hadn't come up with a C++ standard. And we were being used on the Joint Strike Fighter, top to bottom, all the subs for code coverage and, and so on. And they developed the JSF AV standard. I heard about from their side. Yeah, it's a monster, that, that standard, right? It's, they're taking a big chunk of the standard template library. <laughs> and, and they're trying to get very, very deterministic behavior, you know, 10 to the minus ninth number of defects per operating hour. Uh, on a whole bunch of different types of silicon running various RTOSs, you know, it's how do you get, because they want to get that reusability. But then, of course, when you're doing uh, inheritance and polymorphism and all that fun stuff, much of which isn't allowed in JSFAV, uh, the actual embedded object code, executable object code that you end up producing, ends up changing a great deal based on how compilers handle that C. So that was a difficult standard for us to get our mind around. And, uh, we worked with Lockheed for three or four years on, on that, and eventually Grady Butch came in and put a stamp on it. So, so he got his name in there, but we got ours in there too. <laughs> but then all of those lessons we learned from there is where Visor 2008 came out of. So up to about four or five years ago, JSF AV was still the most uh, uh, popular uh, C++ coding standard in, that, that we run into in the safety critical embedded space. And then the last five, six years, we've seen Visor C++ uh, 2008 really overtake it. Uh, Misra C 2012 came along and addressed a lot of issues uh, in Misra, uh, in the previous generations of Misra by defining these concepts of uh, underlying types and so on, and really tried to make the standard a lot easier to uh, automate checking for in a tool, whether it's in a compiler or uh, in our tools or uh, our competitors' tools or whatnot. Uh, it also allowed for formal mechanism of deviations because you can't always fit a square peg into a round hole. You have to have a, a, a protocol for writing a deviation and so on and so on. So uh, um, it's come a long way, and I, I see Misra C 2012 being adopted a lot faster, a lot easier. There's some other interesting variants of Misra. Um, so if you're using single link, you can generate Misra AC code, Misra autocode compliant. Misra AC is a standard. I think it's in this picture. See that? There is the Misra AC standard. And similarly generates code that's compliant to Mr. AC. I don't know, exactly compliant or almost compliant, I don't remember. There's a, uh, this is the C language variant of this. There's a C++ one. Rhapsody, if you happen to be using UML and generating code out of Rhapsody, generates almost compliant code to Mr. C++ 2008. I don't know how much, there is some adoption of SCADE in the automotive industry, which is more used for flight controls uh, typically, but they're generating Mr. C compliant code starting this year. So you're getting a lot more you know, code, standards compliant code being generated. And then of course, there's legacy code, which is all of our burden to carry. And if you try to hammer a legacy piece of code into Misra, you're often gonna break more things than you fix, right? So what's your personal experience dealing with legacy code, auto-generated code, and writing Greenfield's, Greenfield's development and try to harmonize, normalize them across coding standards. So we, we typically exclude third party and auto-generated coding out of those runs. We only check what we have. We can't control the auto-generated stuff. We got to trust their code generator. We own the air quality for it. We do it. That's what we investigate and check. Right, right. Have, do they have a TR? Do they have a TUV certificate? Do they have a certificate for their code generator and so on? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Anybody else tried to meet a coding standard with legacy code? And involved managing a supplier who was trying to meet them. And, and was it just a long iterative process with a diminished point of diminishing returns? <laughs> so what we recommend, yeah, please. No, if there is a third party code like open source, do people do? 
Uh, typically, <laughs> typically. Yeah, if, if you pull open source code into your application, then, then you're stuck with the problems that it comes with. So you, know, you need to do the work to, to clean that up and adopt it, or create some kind of a distinct partition from your application in it and have a different way of managing the risks for that. that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, you, you're probably not going to grab the Linux kernel and go in there and make it miser compliant, hand it back to Richard Stallman and say, here you go, buddy. Because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, financially feasible. You know, you may pick out a few nuggets and, and then adopt it, but uh, it's typically not feasible. But we find that for legacy code, just pick the low hanging fruit, you know, dereference null pointers, uh, 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 the defaults and case statements, array bounds exceeded, shifting too far, unsigned uh, indexes to uh, arrays for, loop, uh, for counters for loops, the stuff that's just going to cause runtime errors, uh, just consistent types, you know, don't set a, a float into an int and those kinds of things. And once you kind of go through that, it's about 15, 20% of the effort of actually going full Misra, but you've really kind of reduce 70, 80 percent of the risk, right? And the other practice we, we recommend is if you go in there and start changing a module and you're past the 30 percent threshold, I've changed more than 30 percent of this 100 lines of code, I've changed 30 lines, all right, I'll go ahead and beat the rest of it into MISRA compliance and it's okay, this, this is going to be checked against the MISRA standard. And slowly sort of eat away at it. I'm, I'm sure you had to do some of that during your... Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. So you're saying if it's above 30%, you refactor? Or, or you yes, above 30%, we typically refactor. That's, that's what I, I recommend. This is the ballpark, you know. I, I've heard that from the aviation guys, something like that. Because the cost of validation is more than the cost of writing, so. Right. You get, get smaller, it saves money. Yes, and there's, there's an inflection for it, right? Because if you get a chance to take something that's like four levels of conditionals deep and break it up into two separate functions, it's going to cost you half as much time to get code coverage of that, right? So it's, it's worth it to, to now I've got met, met my uh, coding standard and I've made it easier to test uh, and with an incremental amount of effort because I'm already in that body of code. So I'm having to think about it. If you don't get your head in the game if you're, and you're hacking around and moving parentheses around, you're certainly going to create a problem down the road, right? So just, just through most of that, yeah, this is the, the you know, our trying to uh, uh, reconcile all these different sources of code, right? Legacy code, auto-generated code, uh, third party, uh, and any new development. And these were the, the, the different uh, standards of code, gen types of misery code generated by uh, modeling tools. So this is a nice example of, of why it's worth getting a good coding standard in-house. This is A plus, MISDA wants to make sure that A plus B plus C is always going to be equivalent to C plus B plus A, right? Which is not always true, right? It's true in mathematics, but it's not always true when you implement it, especially when A, B, and C are of different types <laughs> of different sizes, right? You get things like integer promotion, and you go from 16-bit architecture to 32-bit architecture, so your integer promotion happens in a different order, and you get, you get uh, uh, loss of fidelity, and then your, that little error that you didn't plan for in your error budget starts to grow, and then all of a sudden your application doesn't have the same... Uh, level of behavior. So this is a very simple example, but this becomes more relevant now when we're, when we're working with ARM and x86 and PowerPC and five, six different architectures, maybe multiple types of Indian misses. So you're trying to hit so many different targets, lots of different cross compilers, this type of error starts to poke his head out more. Especially with a legacy system, everything worked fine for 20 years. <laughs> now you're porting to new hardware, new tool chain, two, three different variants, and these little guys come out of the woodwork. It's a very common one. I like this example. This is a simple array bounds exceeded example. We have an array of size 10. Uh, 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 I is our counter, and we're driving it past the length of the array. So we're, we're getting to 20, right? This is easy to catch when you're looking at it now. But in reality, that 10 and 20 is probably a macro or, <laughs> or a variable buried six headers deep. <laughs> and you can't see it when you look at it. You've got to let a tool, tool look through these types of issues. And this is not only a safety issue, it's also a big security issue, right? It, it, it lets, lets people get past and insert in logic. 
So on, on the security front, uh, what we found is, is there's a whole family of coding standards that do great for safety. And then now there's a family of coding standards that are growing for security. Uh, it's, it's sort of led by this guy and the guy at the bottom right, Robert Secord. He just left Carnegie Mellon uh, about three, four months ago. We talk all the time in the, uh, this last year. And, but basically, this is a coding standard focused on security. You know? And uh, we've done a lot of work making sure that we're compliant to it. The reality is, now that you're considering auto generate code, legacy code, hand code, now you have to think about secure code. <laughs> so what we typically find that our mature customers will pluck a good chunk of stuff from here, pluck a big chunk of Misra, and <laughs> create one. So that, that creating those filters for coding standards for your organization is not as simple a task as it used to be. But you can preempt a lot of other types of issues down the road. Please. They're probably probably adopting I know that it. Yeah, I know that DARPA hacking, they were looking at you know, languages that made you know, cyber more you know, easier to maintain. So. Yeah, not, not only this, the same set of guys that are contributing to this are also on the WG14 committee for the next C standard spec, okay. trying to make C itself uh, a bit better. And now there's a separate set of rules that are spinning off of it. And then CWE, Common Weakness Enumeration, which is a minor uh, um, uh, enumeration of all vulnerabilities, most of their coding standards violations happen to map very closely to this. So it's probably a community of 70, 80 people <laughs> that are adding to this body of knowledge and is bouncing around. We just happen to about 30 of them, and you'll probably bump into the same, same folks. And, and they've been thinking about this stuff a long time, so it's good to go pick their brains. So. The, the advantage of coding standards is you're trying to catch a defense before you put them in, <laughs> right? So you don't want to necessarily apply a coding standard at, just with your compiler and, oh, by the way, go generate and see if I'm compliant to my coding standard. Uh, here's this huge five gig report <laughs> with tons and tons of data and, you know, after you go through a bit of it, you just look at the easy stuff and move on. It's just too hard, right? So when you're working with coding standards, the best thing to do is try to get things done at the developer desktop. Just like unit test, you'd want to kind of build it as you're, because you know about it. You know, it's fresh in your head. And, and you make it adhering to the coding standard, rerun and compile, make sure you're set, and you're meeting the coding standard. So you whittle them down right then and there. So the best thing to do with coding standard checking is to get it integrated into an IDE, right? So if you're working in Eclipse, if you're working with uh, NetBeans, you know, we, we had to do it because it was just, customers kept asking us for it, Visual Studio. And then also run it at the build, build level. Right? So you get a couple of filters. It's just worth it to put the extra effort up front with coding standards because the one guy that slips through is going to cost you 15, 20, 100 times more down the road you know, just to catch an integration. And most of us have probably spent some time in a lab and a scope trying to figure out why the heck this thing is going wrong and say, oh, man, it overwrote right there. Ah, oh, that little tight thing, if I had gotten that right. You know? <laughs> Somebody should have picked an unsigned int instead of a signed int or whatnot. So uh, um, it's really important to... Uh, to get this right early. The other part about coding standards that people don't realize the benefit of is, is if you write a coding standard well, it makes your code a lot easier to test. So anybody familiar with the term cyclomatic complexity? So basically, uh, 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 any program can be converted into a mathematical graph. Each uh, one statement or two statements can be converted into a node. Any branch, if then else, is an, in an edge, and you get a mathematical graph. Cyclomatic complexity measures the number of cycles in the graph. If you remember your math, traveling salesman problem stuff, right? You know, you're measuring cycles and the shortest path and all that stuff. So it gives you a, a, a good measure of how complex your function is. If your cyclomatic complexity is high, if you have multiple return statements from your function, if you have a high knots count, which I can mention later, but it's all about crossing arcs in your control flow, then getting 100% coverage is going to be very, very tough. <laughs> Right? Because you'll be able to get here, but getting there will take a lot of creativity and thinking. But as soon as you hit that threshold and you say, oh, I've hit my cyclomatic complexity of 15, I better break this up into two functions. That's going to save the guy 18 months later when he's trying to get code coverage <laughs> that last 5% a lot of time. So this is one of the biggest, I, I rant and rave about it up front. Just get the coding standard part right, you'll save yourself a lot of effort. This is showing how, how we uh, map to CERT. A whole bunch of different tools are out there mapping to them. And CERT is actually an interesting uh, standard, uh, as in uh, they publish a wiki with different tools and how, they, how you're doing with compliance to those tools. So this is our, our LDRA page in the CERT wiki. 
So most of these standards have some really great resources. Uh, uh, for instance, CWE, Common Weakness Enumeration on Security, uh, produces a huge database of vulnerabilities uh, from OWASP down to different source code level issues, data structures, unsigned cast, and then into encryption and so on. So all those phenomenal set of web resources that you should tap into and that you can easily uh, uh, look through to, to uh, clear things up. I was trying to uh, get a sense of the, the size of code. And I don't know if you've seen this picture, this information is beautiful picture where they had the amount of code in different types of applications. And this is your iPhone app, uh, Space Shuttle, and we're into millions of lines of code. F-22 Raptor, which we're on, uh, and then uh, drones, we're on several of them, we're venues on uh, Global Hawk and so on. And then when you get further along, uh, F-35, I mentioned that to you a bit ago. And then you get to car software. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the 100 million line? And in fact, the original version of this picture, uh, instead of being uh, uh, you know, total DNA or, or Google internet services, it was healthcare.gov, but it was a joke. <laughs> you know? So. Car stuff is pre-automation, right? I'm sorry? It's pre-automation and complexity. Right, right, <laughs> right. But this, this is only gonna grow. When you get into autonomous vehicles, I mean, all of you are seeing just the explosion in the amount of, uh, of code you're dealing with. So if F-35 is way up in the list, and obviously this is produced by many, many vendors, lots of pieces, a whole bunch of libraries, you know, it's not 100 million lines of code written from scratch. But this, the, the, the code base is growing super fast. I, I always wonder what kind of anxiety you feel uh, as leaders in your organization as you see this code base growing faster and the need to meet the standards. Uh, uh, that bar is going up at the same time. Is that just unnerving or is if everybody's dealing with it, so it's all of our problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, right. I'm supposed to be shaking the dirt loose up here. Uh, one of the things that we provide uh, is, uh, you know, and this is, this is, you know, tool agnostic, is checking for quality metrics. And we talked about cyclomatic complexity, but things like, you know, number of loops and uh, unreachable code, and then uh, um, uh, number of return statements and so on. When I, when I was a field engineer for a long time and people would chunk 50,000 lines of code at me as I'm about to catch a flight, I said, oh, go pull some dirt from this carpet and show me that you have a good tool. So instead of trying to run a coding standard against that whole code base, I would run this quality metrics and it would give me this sort of clarity, maintainability, and I would look for the red spots, the hot spots, and sort of drill down into it and look for runtime errors and coding standards. I usually find stuff in a couple hours and then make a slide deck and show them that it's useful. But when you're bringing in code from a third party <laughs> or pulling in legacy code into another application, it's really nice to assess that risk up front and, and, and see how you, how you stand instead of trying to just, because it, it does become a guessing game. And if you can find the hot spots early and figure out your tolerance for those hot spots, you can uh, measure what you're pulling in a lot better. Are you, are you familiar with these terms, data flow and control flow analysis? Yeah, beyond the code coverage itself, but actually doing the analysis and checking against your architecture and all that. How are you doing that internally? I'm just curious. Okay, so you're using state machines, sequence diagrams, looking at the, uh, the behavior of runtime, who's calling who, and then maybe you're doing some analysis with a debugger to see if that's consistent. Right, and there's a lot of different aspects of this, right? There's control flow between functions, there's control flow between big subsystems that are writing lots of messages between data. There's, uh, uh, there is a new Yes. You're partially instrumenting code because you're blowing frames and you, you don't have enough memory to store all the coverage data. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's the Heisenberg effect, right? You try to measure something, you're going to affect its behavior. 
and, and the, the cooler and more interesting and small it is, the more you're going to push it out of the way with your big fat finger. Right? So what, the, one of the ways we deal with it is that we, we've made our instrumentation super light. Our, our static analysis is very deep, so we actually had to do path level analysis so we could in, insert probes just at the, um, at the branch level instead of putting something at every line. You know? Uh, we had to come up with lots of different technologies, but there's, there's, there's no one solution. You know, one system may have more RAM, but not enough flash. <laughs> Another one uh, may be uh, squeezed down to a few hundred microsecond loop, where other one gives me 10 milliseconds, so I, I don't have to worry about timing as much. You know? So you can kind of play with those thresholds to get that in there. Data flow and control flow itself on its own, beyond code coverage, is a little bit of a beast on its own. This is an example of keeping track of all of your data global variables and seeing in one time what was actually set in red. So when you're pulling data off of an interface and you're adding them to a global data structure, an algorithm is coming along and grabbing those, those, uh, uh, that data, doing some crunching and spitting something out, and then, then some I.O. gets done and sent out to the real world. Do you know if that data is stale or not? Is there any way for you to quickly identify what, when the set use pairs are happening across these component boundaries? So we ended up keeping track of all the data elements and, and, and then overlaying coverage with it and being able to sort of create a data coverage, right? But there's no simple way of, of ensuring this uh, beyond melding together uh, data analysis and structural coverage analysis together. You could do a lot of it with a debugger, but those are kind of, you know, sharpshooting areas. You can't, it's difficult to do it uh, in mass. So structural coverage, uh, code coverage, most of us, or, uh, if you're going to meet 2662, you're going to have to do this stuff. And this is kind of painful. Lots of different kinds of structural coverage. There's entry points to make sure every function has actually been called. There's statements. Has every line actually been executed? There's branches. Has every line, and then if you look at a compound if, has a true and the false been hit? And there's MCDC, which is a, a type of reduction of the truth table generated from a compound conditional. It's a, it's a, it helps you remove the not, not so important cases. So those different levels of coverage map to a table, to 6662, and that maps to the different ASIN levels. So figuring out where you stand for which part of your components of your application for what ASIN levels to that set of rigor level in coverage is important. Because MCDC is going to cost you a lot more time to do than entry point. <laughs> Branch coverage is going to cost you 30% more than just statement on its own. But statement branch and MCDC on a large legacy system is going to be very, very difficult. Take you a long time to get there. So kind of assessing that up front and baking that into your, uh, uh, into your development model, into your cost expectations, is, is really important. So lots of ways of viewing coverage data and measuring coverage. Um, but ultimately, code coverage just basically tells you how effective were my tests. If I ran through all of my tests and 40% of my code isn't covered, why is that code there? Well, maybe my tests aren't that good. Maybe my requirements weren't that great to begin with when I wrote my tests. Maybe that code needs to be ripped out. But it forces you to ask that question. Otherwise, you tend to have this big black box saying, hey, I've got a bunch of requirements here and a bunch of tests and everything's great, I'm good. Black box ship. But you're not looking in the black box. <laughs> and th this, is, this forces you to measure how effective your tests are and forces you to reconcile requirements, test, and code uh, and sort of tighten that news around it to get your system to be more and more deterministic. And this practice is used by every major safety critical center on the planet. In rail, in, industrial, in automotive, and in, in industrial controls, medical devices, and so on. So these were all the different types of, types of uh, code coverage. Just a quick tour through them all. Uh, first, uh, statement and branch. So there's entry point coverage to make sure have I actually called. This is, a, this is a function that wasn't called. Here's statement coverage. These are the guys that were actually called. This is the one that it wasn't. And this was my node in my mathematical graph that wasn't executed. These were the branches that were executed. This was the branch that was not. But then when you get into branches, you're actually looking at the arrows itself, right? Did I call the F? Did I call the else? Did I write in a requirement that took care of the if case and the off nominal case? And did I write a test case that would actually stimulate the off nominal case? So the code coverage really shows you if you took the branch and executed the, the code that was supposed to pick up the else condition. 
uh, branch decision coverage, and then modified uh, condition decision coverage. Basically, if you have uh, um, you know A or B and C or D predicate uh, predicate calculus that we learned uh, in discrete math, you know, in computer science, you have a two of the n number of possible combinations, right? So if you have uh, you know four combinations, it's going to be 16 branch combinations. MCDC has a n plus one number of tests you have to do. So what does that tell you to do? If you have ASL4, have a coding standard that limits the number of elements in a compound conditional. Do not allow somebody to have 10 elements and possibly 1,024 tests buried five levels if deep inside of a loop. Because you'll kill yourself trying to get that coverage. But you can, you can preempt that at code, coding standards stage early, right? So unless this thing is actually kind of flashed in front of your face, you might not pick up on it. Or of course, unless you've suffered trying to doing this. Right, right. Uh, the, one of the coverage metrics is called uh, uh, LC. This is the truth table reduction thing. But one of the uh, uh, metrics is called LCSAJ. I'll get to it. But, but the actual test paths, all possible combinations of paths, so that you can mathematically show a hundred line program would generate 10 to the 18th number of paths, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe. <laughs> We're not going to get through that in time. So. Uh, yeah, reduction of the combinatorial explosion is a science in itself, and you have to be very preemptive about it. Otherwise, you're going to start out with all kinds of good intentions, and you just we're going to run out of steam. Uh, some interesting things. I just brought put this in from Deal 178 because I think it's really important to understand that we're not shipping the code that we're covering. We're shipping the executable object code that we've compiled and built and linked. So what, what the avionics standard says that if your compiler is doing something funny to your to your code, it's inserting something. So here's a bit of C code. That's the generated assembly code. And that's the control flow of the two. So the C code is that the little pretty picture at the left. And there's this wacky looking picture on the right is the unrolled case statements and whatever the compiler decided to do. So the nodes and the branches are very different, especially in compound conditionals, in the assembly code as it is in your, in your C code. That's something important to remember. And so in this example, we'd run tests to get 100% coverage, statement branch and MCDC of the C code. And when we ran those same tests on the instrumented assembly, we found there's an additional branch in there. It was generated by the compiler. But, and compilers aren't deterministic on how they do this. You know, they'll, they'll unroll the loop one way in one part, of the, uh, uh, one part of the assembly generation, and they'll unroll it a different way somewhere else. Yes, but it's still not quite deterministic. I've spent so many hours with a bunch of airframe guys going through the second half of a compiler's manual, going through loop unrollings and playing with representative code and getting assembly coverage. We can't always get the consistent behavior. The solution would be a, a real certified compiler, not, not one that actually has been done code coverage on the compiler's code itself. And it's, but compiler will change too fast, too many targets. It's not, it's not feasible from a business standpoint. The most intense form of coverage is the one that LCSAJ, that's path coverage, right? So the statement branch, LCSAJ, MCDC. And the nice thing about this is, you know, it, you have to do, for any coverage, you have to do the static analysis first, and then you're taking what actually happened and trying to, uh, trying to represent what actually executed in the control flow and what didn't. In LCSAJ, the static analysis itself shows you all possible exhaustive paths through your application, right? You can detect uh, an unreachable code that way. But here's a nice example. This is a test. <laughs> so we're going to, in this example, we have a little snap, snippet of code. We're getting speed. We've got mode A, mode B, and distance. And we're calculating speed down here. Okay. So that's the control flow of that code. Nothing super sophisticated. A couple of ifs and a, and a little assignment. When I create these two test cases, I'm able to get 100% statement coverage and branch coverage. So is this code safe? Right, one, one, zero, zero. It's not right to give you this test with this distance. You should print it out folders. But anyway, just to let you show you what actually happens is we have these start times and stop times coming in. And there is a condition where if stop time and start time are actually the same, then you do a divide by zero, right? But I've got 100% statement of branch coverage, but I'm still 
I've got to divide by zero in such a simple piece of code. So our, our tendency is to say, oh, my system is working, everything passes, and I've got a nice uh, warm security blanket, uh, but I've got something as simple as a divide by zero <laughs> that's, that's sticking out. So I'll just kind of rush to the rest of this. I, I've been uh, going for a bit longer than uh, I expected. But uh, so unit testing. Um, so here, here's a bit that, you know, we talked about traceability of unit tests to low level requirements. But in effect, unit testing is plucking out a little piece of an application out of its womb and generating another harness around it so you can shake it with more uh, uh, vigor at that granularity, right? So you have a lot of challenges that you have to deal with unit testing, uh, including not only testing the parameters that affect a function, but global variables that affect the function, right? So it's easy to grab a little function and pull it out of its womb, but then what if that function is looking at a data structure that's you know, buried five headers deep? Another set of challenges is that if you're testing uh, uh, one function and one file and there are 30 functions in that file, how do you know which variables affect that function and which ones are not relevant to it, <laughs> right? You have to go do a bunch of scavenger hunting. Of course, we end up uh, uh, doing some smart data flow analysis to highlight those for you. But unit testing itself was one of those things that was very encouraged many years ago, and then it became too cost prohibitive, and then tools have come along and is now encouraged again, right? And so as integration testing got better, did you see a pattern like this? Unit testing was encouraged in the 80s, and all of a sudden, mid to late 90s, Everybody's got all kinds of integration tests and not as many unit tests, and then it's picked back up. I think everybody's experience is probably different. It's probably because I got stuck doing unit tests. <laughs> Point. Um, let me just get past uh, much of this. Unit testing is, of course, another scope at which you can get code coverage. That's something important to remember, right? So you could get code coverage by running through functional tests and verify uh, high-level SRS requirements, and then you can get uh, coverage using unit tests. And sometimes it's better to do unit testing first because it's early in the life cycle, you've got that done. But if you feel like all your SDD elements are fine and your, those tests pass and you've got coverage, but you've got lots of great bricks. You just have to make sure the, the integration of those pieces happen correctly. And I'll get past most of this. The, the part that I did want to touch on was the, the modeling and simulation bit, because most of us are, are realizing if we don't go to the modeling world that we're, we're not going to be able to keep growing and improving as organizations. The biggest part of modeling is we tend to do a lot of verification in the model and just trust that universe. But we all know that the rubber meets the road is where things break, but the modeling environment is so nice, so polished, and, you know, you can, you can drag over stuff from a tool, toolkit or toolbox from Simulink and drum things with Test Conductor and Rhapsody and get model coverage. So you have to have a paradigm to be able to take, and the technology to be able to make the transformation from model to model generated code or to executable, from model tests to metadata and to code test tools running on the target. Right? And that transformation, we've invested a lot of time and money with our partners to get there, and others are doing the same. And then you have to figure out how to instantiate that in your, in your world. So for instance, you can run uh, model tests and get model coverage in Simulink, and then run it in their software in the loop, or process it in the loop mode on the instrumented version of the code generated by an embedded coder, and, and get code coverage on target. So, I have a good bit on security to cover, but I think I've overshot my time. I'm going to uh, pause here and just let you know that um, this, the, just in summation of overall in, uh, with respect to security, is that it's very, very fragmented space. Uh, you will see standards all over the map from common criteria to NIST to CWE and CERT, and your internal chief engineers are going to be struggling to cobble them together to make something for yourself that makes sense. And I see a lot of moving parts. I'm happy to come discuss them with you later uh, tomorrow when we're at the booth or later today. Uh, but getting both a security hat and a safety hat, and you'll find there's a lot of overlap. We have code coverage, robustness testing, unit testing, uh, coding standard selection, you know, some of the ones we mentioned earlier. There's a lot of overlap, but it's just a different perspective. And you have to think about attack surfaces in one day, and you have to think about verifying expected functional functionality in the other. But you use a unit test to kind of verify both in some cases. So you, having the right subject matter experts and the right 
right hats, carrying them all around so you can switch them back and forth is uh, really important. And this was just an example of the, uh, catching the hard bleed, uh, the one that was very famous a couple of years ago, right? The, the open SSL issue. Everybody pulls an open SSL. Oh, it says SSL, so it must work. There's a couple of guys that are contributing via the Free Software Foundation to, to this library. And the poor guy forgot to check the length of the padding. And everybody threw the oranges at him for the next, next uh, so many years. And a whole, lot of, a whole lot of people got bit by this. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, do you have uh, any final questions? Please. Uh, of, of. Well, there's just tons of different ways of uh, approaching, validating, and verifying behavior at that that scope, right? I mean, you can have hardware and loop simulations. You can have different individual components, and then the rest of it all simulated. You can have uh, an entire vehicle running on something that fakes this guy thinking it's, it's moving along. You can have requirements written at the entire system system scope, uh, and then one's broken down granularly for each subsystem, down for uh, uh, every component within it. But which one would be enough for like, to be satisfying the physical rating for some functions? Because as you mentioned, like, as soon as the tire hits the road, then it's where the problems arise, and simulating it only catches errors and problems. It's not practical, right? Right. You have to do all levels of them, and you have to reduce this, the, 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 the combinatorial explosion down to the set that actually meets the requirements. I mean, this is really about taking well-written, high-level requirements of a system and decomposing them down and making sure each layer is properly tested. Because you can't do every level of testing. You can't drive a car around forever trying to get code coverage for all 100 million lines of code. It's just not, not going to happen. Right? But you can't get a 100% uh, coverage of every, every piece of code that you have and everything's unit tested and expect the car to work either. Because <laughs> right? you just going to have a bunch of shiny bricks and nothing's going to work. So you have, each layer has its own responsibility and scope to verify. So I mean, that's, uh, what's uh, part four? Part, which, which one's the system testing part in 26262? Quiz, four? Yes, thank you. So that's, that's specifically part four of ISO 26262. So, in fact, uh, if you'd like afterwards, we can kind of go over some of that portion, and then I'll show you how that links to part six. Um, because each, each layer has its responsibility, each set of scopes, scope to address. Right. Right, right. So, and, and that has a lot to do with this, you know, defining which one of your requirements and which one of your design elements are actually safety related. Okay. Earlier we established that there are two or three different approaches of considering everything and considering and really doing a thorough job of breaking it down into safety, non safety, even within safety, breaking it by SL and decomposing it to yes. or whatever, and then defining the test suites or testing everything under the sun all the way to the MCDC. Right, which is not always practical, yeah. Uh, so, so I actually talked to uh, my colleague from India this morning about that exact same question. And he used to work at TRW here in Detroit. And he works with uh, several folks that are on the 26262 committees. And they had the same conversation yesterday. A and uh, he gave him a couple of different approaches. One is after you identify what your safety-related requirements are, make sure you do the traceability of the design elements. And once you've done that analysis, then you have to typically add column attributes showing what the risks are and do mitigation activities and how those mitigation activities will be inherited by typical testing and what atypical testing has to be done for those. The one interesting one that I've never heard of before was that how do you approach this with legacy systems? So you have to go through an analysis and review of your code base because you don't have all those artifacts and all that analysis already done. And then create little safety specific requirements. You know, if you're in DL-178 world, you would call them derived requirements. And, and those will encapsulate uh, the expected behavior of that little component. And then 
tacking on to it the, the type of testing and risk mitigation activities you do. So you have this massive amount of code you're dealing with. You've sharp shot, sharp shooted uh, a few of the pieces that you know are safety related, and then you kind of build your little V around it, <laughs> along with your risk and risk mitigation activities. So that's, that's, we had that conversation this morning, and I'll try to, he's writing a paper on 26262 now. And like to, we'll discuss this offline. Sure. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Well, th this guy used to work at TRW, so you probably know him. <laughs> oh, right, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not an automotive system level guy. So th there's probably plenty of guys in this room that can give you a much better sense of that. And that will probably vary all over the place depending upon the kind of system you're trying to verify. So you need a real subject matter expert who's gone through a whole family of technologies in, in, in your space to give you a good sense of uh, order of magnitude of testing. What I've seen from Bosch is about you know, like, you know, 30 billion miles. Wow. Which isn't right. It's a lot of spins around the earth, yeah. <laughs> that's, they said, that's the problem. We can't do that. So. Right, right. Only one two hundredth of a light year. <laughs> yeah. so what does that mean? I mean, you can't do it. It still doesn't mean that the means that you can't test your system is that, that the approach is just say, like, that's infeasible to be done tested? I think there's probably going to be a systematic reduction. Uh, yeah, what we're trying to do with the architecture is we've got to redesign how we build the system. Right, both uh, on the architecture side and on the verification side, right? Because out of that 30 billion miles, probably you know one tenth of that will get you 90 percent of the way there, mm -hmm. and, and then the rest of it you're 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 trying to catch the top of that curve. And there's probably a lot lower scope of testing you can use to verify those corner cases and those types of behaviors, whether they're just at a system level test instead of driving a vehicle around, or even down to all the way to a unit test trying to catch a little exception handling condition that you can't generate from driving a car around. You know, you break, drive fast, drive off a road, whatever it takes. You just can't get to that stinging exception condition, but you can with a uh, uh, with a low level test or unit test. So you really have to 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 uh, personally, I think you have to make sure that you meet your f requirements at that scope. And make sure those requirements have been written properly at that scope. And once you've met those expected behaviors, you may not be able to meet them all with exhaustive testing at that scope. You may choose to do a lower granularity of testing to get to that next level. And this is a pattern that's there in automotive and medical devices and avionics. Very common pattern. I'm just curious how that's going to be addressed because the combinatorial complexity we get like events like ice and sunny and rainy and whatever. We can combine, I mean, we have to drive in all this environment to actually test the system. Right, right. And is there any way to address it? Is it really just like. In your specific domain, that situation, I don't know. But in a general case, that's the way I see it addressed. It's really hit all the requirements, test you can, get to a point of diminishing returns, get down to a lower scope, and try another approach, <laughs> and break it down. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I've used up more than my lot of time. So, uh, so thank you again for, uh, for, uh, for joining us today. And, and uh, we'll see you at the booth. Maybe uh, Aaron is, may want to get Aaron up here. I kept looking at my Apple Watch to see if I was late, and it was on the heart rate mode. <laughs> so all I could see is my heart rate. <laughs> Hello. All right, so we're going to take another just really quick break, um, 10 to 15 minutes, just stretch your legs before the last presentation of the day. If you have any questions for this presentation or any, please let me know, and I will gather you all at about 2.55, 3 o'clock. And there, the, there's some cookies and chips and lemonade and whatnot outside where the lunch was as well. Speak to you soon. <laughs>